Hello friends, welcome back to Tutorials in English Literature. In today's lesson, we shall take a look at the Cavalier poets and the characteristics of their poetry. We shall also analyze how Cavalier poetry differs from metaphysical poetry, which was also popular during the 17th century. First, let me explain the term Cavalier. Cavalier is the nickname for the royalists who fought, who supported Charles I during the civil wars. Like roundhead, Cavalier originated as a term of abuse, stemming from the Spanish word caballero. It was meant to connote Catholicism foreignness and immorality. The word was current by the summer of 1642 and referred to the disorganized and untrustworthy men who had backed, who had supported the king in the bishops wars and the army plots of 1641. Parliamentary propagandists accordingly circulated an image of the typical cavalier as a rakish, immoral individual consumed by the pursuit of illicit pleasure and personal gain, a man devoid of moral principles. Now let's start our discussion about the cavalier poets. Cavalier poets is a group of English poets associated with Charles I and his exiled son. Charles, a connoisseur of the fine arts, supported poets who created the art he craved, he preferred. These poets in turn grouped themselves with the king and his service, thus becoming cavalier poets. They wrote graceful, polished, witty, even brazen lyrics exalting love, praising women and gallant accents. The poetry reveals their indebtedness to both Ben Jensen and John Donne. The best known of the Cavalier poets are Robert Herrick, Richard Lovelace, Thomas Carey and Sir John Suckling. Most of the Cavalier poets were courtiers with notable exceptions. For example, Robert Herrick is a clergyman. He was detached from the court, but his short, fluent, graceful lyrics on love and dalliance and his carpe diem philosophy are typical of the cavalier style. Other poets who were associated with the cavalier tradition were Lord Herbert of Charbury. Aurelian Townsend, William Cartwright, Thomas Randolph, Sir Richard Franco, Edmund Weller, and James Graham, the first Marquis of Montrose. The next point of my discussion is the characteristics of Cavalier poetry. Cavalier poetry is different from metaphysical poetry which was also popular in 17th century. The first difference is in the subject matter. Instead of tackling issues like religion, philosophy and the arts, Cavalier poetry aims to express the joy and simple gratification of celebratory things much livelier than the traditional works of their predecessors. They are cavalier, not only in the sense that uh, they are royalists, but also in the sense that they distrust the over earnest, excessive seriousness. They accept the ideal of the Renaissance gentleman, who is at once a lover, a soldier, a wit, man of affairs, musicians and poet. They avoid the subject of 
religion apart from making one or two graceful speeches they treat life cavalierly indeed and sometimes they treat poetic conventions cavalierly that means not too seriously they believe that the poems must be celebratory of things that are much livelier than mere philosophy or art poetry need not to be a matter of earnest emotion or public concern most cavalier works had allegorical or classical references they drew upon the knowledge of horace cicero and ovid by using these resources they were able to produce poetry that impressed king charles the first the cavalier poets also strove to create poetry where both pleasure and virtue thrived for that reason gallantry and chivalry are central to the cavaliers most of their poems celebrate beauty love nature sensuality drinking good fellowship honor and social life another important characteristic is that many of the poems centered around sensual romantic love and also the idea of carpe diem which means to seize that day to the cavalier poet enjoying life was far more important than following moral codes they lived for the moment these endorments of living life to the fullest for cavalier writers often included gaining material wealth and having sex with women these themes contributed to the triumphant and boisterous tone and attitude of the poetry of cavalier poets a lot of eroticism is visible in their poetry platonic love was also another characteristic of cavalier poetry where the man would show his divine love to a woman where she would be worshiped as a creature of perfection another important characteristic of cavalier poetry is the use of elaborate metaphor the lines in these poems are also very short and precise their poetry was also full of wit especially naughty wit smart responses to situations and clever complimentary remarks to lover another very significant feature of cavalier poetry is that these poets adopted a highly polished style in fact their poetry is noted for being highly stylized and had parallels within a tradition in the mannerist paintings of the period where the emphasis was on style and artifice rather on naturalism thus caroline lyric is the result of conscious effort it is artificial it is a work of art characterized by finish polish and elegance of language but lacking the spontaneity which characterizes the elizabethan lyric it has a formal finish and perfection but it is wanting in natural care and warmth of emotion cavalier poets were influenced by both the foremost poets of the jacobian era ben jonson and john donne so first look how john donne influenced them the conversational tone of their poetry which import a kind of dramatic quality into their poetry is a influence of john donne but donne's influence on the cavalier poets went further than this the cavalier poets sometimes directly imitated donne's concepts lovelace's famous poem to lucasta going beyond the seas and sacklings to mistress sicily crops echo dance the ecstasy and a valediction for wooding morning in more general terms dan gave the cavalier poets the tendency of introspective self analysis so conspicuously lacking in most courtiers and the tendency of argumentation 
using examples from all branches of learning. Like dance poem, some of the cavalier poems show a rare blend of passion and reasoning. But Dan was not the only guiding spirit for the cavalier poets. The greatest influence on these poets was Ben Johnson. Because of the influence of Ben Johnson, the term tribe of Ben is sometimes applied to poets in this loose group. Don't confuse it with the term sons of Ben, which generally applies properly to the dramatist who followed Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson was the first classical lyricist in English literature. He himself wrote under the influence of the Latin lyricists of antiquity, particularly Catullus. Like all classicists, he set store by lucidity and general beauty of expression, chastened and chiseled imagination, and balance and proportion of design. That means a perfect art. The Cavalier poets were especially indebted for the clarity of expression to Ben Johnson. They disowned the turbidity, the cloudiness of dance poetic expression. Their control of emotion, felicity of phrase, and sophistication of tone were some of the qualities of Ben Johnson's verse. Many of them wrote tributary verse to Ben Johnson as they did to John Dunn. In fact, Dunn and Johnson both influenced the Cavalier poets in almost equal proportion and mostly for the better. Let's now consider briefly the work of the four major Cavalier poets we have mentioned above. The most important poet of this group was Robert Herrick. Along with Johnson, Herrick took for his model and inspiration the clear, objective, spirited but perfectly ordered and lucidly worded poetry of the Latin poets like Ovid, Horace, Catullus, Martial and the Greek poet Anacreon. He does not seem to have paid much attention to Elizabethan lyricists before him. But his first guide was Saint Bain, that means Bain Johnson, who ate him a lot. And that is why he invoked Bain Johnson in his poem Prayer to Bain Johnson. His only book, Harpy Rides, or the works both human and divine of Robert Herrick, which appeared in 1648, contains about 1200 poems, few of which extend beyond a hundred lines. Most of them are of the occasional type or of the nature of epigrams. Herrick is a poet of moods and moments and is perhaps incapable of sustained poetic expression. But he is seldom frivolous, inelegant, or um, unsophisticated. His mood and themes have variety, but no complexity. The true metaphysical manner is beyond him. He is incapable of that kind of cerebral intellectual verse. He sings mostly of women, love, wine, and song. But he also exhibits a refreshing love for trees, plants, and flowers and often looks at them as emblems of human predicament. Cherry Rife to Julia and to Althea are some of his best known poems. He is indeed the delight of all anthologists. The next poet of our discussion is Thomas Carey. Whereas Herrick looked to Johnson alone. Carey blends in his poetry the metaphysical manner of Dunn and the classical spirit of Ben Johnson. His poems on Dunn and Johnson express admirably his keen appreciation of his two guides. Johnson was to 
him greater than all men else and done the poet worth all that went before. Carey shows more of critical intelligence and sense of pattern than Herrick, but he suffers in imaginative power which gets a substitute in a kind of courtly wit. Among his popular poems may be mentioned upon a ribbon tied about his arm by a lady, a long title. And then there is a rapture and love's courtship and be that loves a rosy cheek. The third poet of our discussion is Sir John Suckling. Suckling in his poetry shows twin influence of Johnson and Dunn like Carey. His clinical observations on female capriciousness, whimsicality and inconstancy and his hard introspective realism remind one of Dunn. His best known poem is the song from Agalaura, Why So Pale and One Fond Lover, which expresses sentiment typical of John Dunn. The last poet of our discussion is Richard Lovelace. Lovelace is probably the least important of the four poets that I am discussing here. He was a very well-educated courtier and was even sent to prison for favoring the king during the civil war. It was in 1648 while he was in prison he prepared for the press his volume entitled Lucasta. The subtitle of the book is Epodes, Odes, Sonnets, Songs, etc. to which is added Amarantha, a pastoral. So it's a long subtitle. Though his poems are full of freshness and exuberance, he lacks the fancy of Herrick, the force of suckling and the polish of Carey. I am concluding my discussion here. If you like this lesson, please hit the like button. If you still have any doubt or query, you can ask me in the comment section. I also request you to subscribe to my channel where you will get a regular update of this kind of quality content. That's all for today. Thank you for watching.